Welcome aboard the National Football Show. Your boy, Dan Cilio. Sports calendar is just dope right now, man. I mean, I'm having a good time watching the NBA playoffs. I never thought I'd ever say that in my entire life, that I'd have a good time watching the NBA playoffs. I'm also, you know, excited to see what the Tampa Bay Lightning, New York Islanders are going to do in the Eastern Conference. Those are two of my favorite franchises. You know, in hockey history, I grew up with the Islanders. You know what's crazy about growing up with the Islanders? Every year I was in high school, they won the Stanley Cup. Every year I was in high school, and I used to go to that barn, and that place is going to be electric, no question. Game seven, defending Stanley Cup champions. Like I said, the basketball. You know, I, I, I've got to give it to the NBA. I thought without having guys like LeBron James and guys like Kevin Durant and players like that not – in the conference finals, we would all be doing something like this. Hey, man, you know, isn't it boring? There's no superstars, but there's actually something to say about watching guys like Trey Young and these dudes with the Atlanta Hawks and saying, wow, what a young team. You know, will Giannis end up taking that basketball team to the NBA pinnacle and winning a championship like Jabbar did in Milwaukee years ago? You know, now you're going to get Chris Paul back tonight. How does he fit into that fun-ass Phoenix Suns team to watch. They may be one of my favorite teams to watch in the NBA over the last 10 years. I don't know what it is, man. They just got a lot of energy. It's exciting. And they get Chris Paul back tonight, too. I mean, they, there's the Clippers, who I know finally made a conference finals. You got all of that going around. And then you have, of course, our world, the world of football. We're now a month out, as I've been saying all week long to training camp with Steelers and Cowboys when it comes to the Hall of Fame game. I can't wait to see the ceremony this year on what that's going to mean. You know, I've said this before to you. One of the great things about that Hall of Fame is it's not so much just about the players. It's more about the journey that all these men go on. If you're a coach, if you're you know, a player, everyone's got their own story and how they put one of those gold jackets on. One of the greatest times and moments for me will be watching Jimmy Johnson put that jacket on in front of everybody and then getting up and making his speech and all the people that were associated with his life. I was proud to be a little piece of that, man, when we were all together at the University of Miami. And, you know, when watching Troy Aikman cry, you know, watching all the players that I know get emotional when Jimmy was, you know, informed that he was going to be a Hall of Famer. They did it on the Fox set right there. You know, the NFL on Fox, great show. I love that show, by the way. I think it's the best in football. And, you know, he broke down because it was all about what he had just put his mind to. It was just about winning ball games. Had nothing to do with what anybody thought of him, how they looked at his procedures, and how they looked at it, how he went about building a team. Jimmy was going to do it his way, and his way led to Canton. And so I'm so going to be looking forward to that this coming summer here and right around in the uh, third week of August, I think that's when that ceremony is where those guys will get a chance to get up and tell their story on how they got to Canton, Ohio. So I can't wait for that. By the way, today, Power Pack show for you. Jeff Lagerman, former Jaguar himself and part of the broadcast team, will tell us how everything is going with Trevor Lawrence, Urban Meyer, yes, Tim Tebow. Can they be a surprise team in the upcoming 2021 NFL season. I mean, what will that team look like? They open up with the Houston Texans. I pretty much think that that's going to be a win. And there's no question they're going to be lean forward television because everybody's going to want to see what's going on in Jacksonville. Will Trevor Lawrence be able to take that game that he had that was really just iconic at Clemson and be able – to fit into the National Football League. I think he's going to. I think he's one of the best prospects I've seen at the quarterback position in such a long period of time. So we'll talk to Jeff Lagerman. That'll be at the bottom of the first hour. In hour two, we got a special guest. Ice Cube's going to join us. Big Three Basketball is, without a doubt, one of the fastest-growing sports in professional sports in America. They got a great television contract with CBS. They do so many great things with – you know, the veteran players that call it a career. But guess what Ice Cube did? Ice Cube decided that, you know, he wanted to make sure that he could help these guys as they make their transition into life. 
maybe getting a couple more years of basketball out of him and making a check and making, you know, some hayway. So we'll talk to him about that Olympics, rapping, everything, football. You know, he's a big Raider fan. We'll get his thoughts on that. The Carl Nassib story, we'll ask him. Legendary Raider fan. So that'll be in our number two. All right, let's get into something here that, you know, sometimes perception doesn't really meet reality when you have a thought of a particular player or coach. And where I'm going with this is, and I'll just start it out here with John Gruden. I'm not going to hit on this segment here on John Gruden per se, but I want to give you a perception on how we look at John Gruden. You know, because John Gruden was on television for so many years, you know, we were always under the impression, wow, this guy, man, any team was like, remember any opening that was either professional or college, John Gruden's name was at the top of the list. Everybody wanted to have his services as a head coach. And John passed on numerous jobs because he had a cake job. He was making $6 million a year as a broadcaster for ESPN. Why would you leave that? You're not under any scrutiny. Plus, he was very good at it. They've not been able to really duplicate anybody in that booth. I mean, really, you know, having as many of the people that they've had on, I mean, look, man, no disrespect, but Brian Greasy and guys like that, I mean, Booger McFarlane on a lift going around the field was stupid. I mean, it was dumb. They've not been able to replace that crew, and it's gone downhill. And John was really great at it. That's why John could pick his job. Hey, got a 10-year deal at $6 million a year. John Gruden's going to make over $100 million as the manager and head coach of the Raiders. This guy is the manager of the Raiders now, business-wise as well. And he's also the head coach. That's why he was able to hire Mike Mayock. Well, when you look at the job he's done, he's 19 to 29 since he's been the head coach. Pretty much John Gruden. I mean, outside of that Super Bowl year that he won, John Gruden, I don't know. He's been okay. Look at the record. The record is reality. It's funny, isn't it? The perception of John Gruden is Gruden's one of the best coaches to ever coach in the NFL. He's just a couple games over 500 as a career coach. So where, where, where do you come off with the record and going, well, this guy's one of the best, you know, coaches of all time. He's not. Well, he's got a Super Bowl. I get it. I get it. Brian Billick's got a, he's got a Super Bowl. Okay. Hank Stram's got a Super Bowl. I wouldn't call those guys legendary superstar coaches. So again, I mean, I look at John and I go more perception than what really meets reality, right? Well, let me throw this at you here. And, you know, we kind of were hitting on this a little bit yesterday with Ted Robinson, who was the voice of the San Francisco 49ers. I'm going to throw some numbers at you here, and I think they're pretty telling. So in the four years that Kyle Shanahan has been the head coach of the San Francisco 49ers, if you take the 2019-13-3 NFC Championship team away, he's 16-32. and 32. That's reality. Now, when you add the 13 and three, which you have to, you can't take one of the chapters out of a book. I mean, you're not going to read Moby Dick and take chapter six out. <laughs> you're going to read the whole book. And that's really what, you know, a story is when it comes to a player's career or a coach's career. You read the entire book. I get that. So let's add that 13 and three. So since he's been there four years now as head coach of the 49ers, he's 29 and 35. Okay, four years, you're 29 and 35, and you've had one winning season since you have been the head coach of the 49ers. That's reality. You're 29 and 35. I'm trying to figure out where everyone's going. This guy's one of the greatest coaches, one of the greatest play callers I've ever seen. Well, your record really doesn't dictate that. People will fire back at me and do this. Yeah, well, his quarterback got hurt. <laughs> so are we here to make excuses up for anybody? Injuries are a part of sports. And if you're going to take that chapter out, you could tell the whole story. Well, his quarterback's got hurt three of the four years he's been the head coach. Hey, tell that stuff to Rex Ryan. 
Rex Ryan had to deal with crappy quarterbacks his entire coaching career in New York with the Jets and also up in Buffalo. Guy had to deal with crappy quarterbacks. It happens. But sometimes you win still with crappy quarterbacks. Look at what the Eagles did a couple years ago. They took the greatest substitute teacher of all time in Nick Foles, and they won a Super Bowl with him. It can happen. Remember Matt Castle? Matt Castle was a quarterback in the NFL who was drafted by the New England Patriots. You want to know something about Matt Castle? Matt Castle never in any time of his entire college career started a game at USC. Never started a game. You know he won 11 games as a starting quarterback up in New England? He actually won a division title when he was the starting quarterback in Kansas City. I think Romeo Cornell was the head coach then. It can happen. You can take a quarterback like a Trent Dilfer or a Brad Johnson and win with them. Comes down to coaching. Coaching is so more important in the NFL than in the college ranks. Great coaching, putting you in positions to win. Most importantly, putting the right pieces on the chessboard for you to be able to win. That's the magic of a great head coach. That's what makes Belichick again. And I have another comment about him later on in the program as well. But one of the things that made Bill such a great coach was his halftime adjustments. Bill was notoriously insanely great at going in and knowing exactly what a team was attacking because he had done the homework knowing his own weakness. You see, that's Belichick's secret. Bill knows his team's weakness. He knows other team's strengths. Sometimes the other team's strength can't go after the Patriots' weakness. And Bill goes from a place of weakness when he's preparing for a football game. That's why the coaching in the NFL is such more important than it is at the college level. you got to be a great – I'm not saying coaching in the college ranks is not important, but being a better recruiter is by far more important. Getting the horses into the barn for you to be able to take those guys out and win races with, that's the key in college football. Saban's no better of a coach than what Steve Sarkeesian is now in Texas. He's no better of a coach. He may be a better organizer, but the one thing that Nick Saban does, he knows assistants. He doesn't hold very many things against them. If you're loyal, you can work for him. And if you can recruit and work your ass off, you can definitely be on his coaching staff. Bill, Bill Parcells had the same formula. That's where Bill Belichick learned it from. That's what was passed down to Nick Saban. Nick Saban has all those intangibles that went all the way back to Bill Parcells. Okay? Remember the one thing that Parcells used to always say? You are what your record is. Okay? Well, Kyle Shanahan's 29 and 35. You have another flop season. Can you go like this? Well, we're going to be breaking in a rookie quarterback. Does, does that give you like a hall pass so that you can suck out loud this year again if your team goes sideways and your quarterback position, Jimmy Garoppolo, gets hurt? I'm just going with the disaster here. He ends up getting hurt, and you have to come up with an excuse why the 49ers did not fulfill their prophecy, which to be a Super Bowl contending team. When do you fire this guy? It's got to get to a point. And again, you, you kind of heard it a little bit with Ted Robinson yesterday. Ted was saying this. Hey, you know, Dan, they've only really had, you know, one year of the four years that was successful. The rest of them have all been losing seasons, 6 and 10, 4 and 12, like that. So you take that 2000. And 19 season away, that 13 and three season, they're 16 and 32. Okay, so if you don't have a good quarterback, you're not a very good coach. Man, <laughs> I brought you in because I thought you were a good play caller too. You can win. Oh, well, we got guys like Mullen. Well, okay, well, you're supposed to be working with John Lynch and finding an answer to this. Now, maybe Trey Lance is the answer. Maybe he's the answer. I don't know. But it's got to come down to, you know, a time of reckoning here where you start asking the question, hey, man, can this guy coach or not? He's got all the flash. He's the young, good-looking guy. He's got the last name. Everyone wants to give him the benefit of the doubt. Okay. 
let's go out and have a successful 2021 season. I think eyeballs are going to be on him. I think they're going to be on him and they're going to be looking at him. Okay. When it comes to being able to develop the quarterback position, that's all I'm saying here. All right. I want to throw this out here. You know, I think this is really something that the NFL is really getting better and better at. And now they're going to start taking bids for the combines from NFL teams. You know what that means, right? You know how they have like a fan experience week set up for the uh, Pro Bowl? You know, you can go there and there's a fan experience. There, You know, the fans get a chance to go there. You get a chance to be around, you know, some of the Pro Bowl players. It's really cool how the NFL does it. And they've turned that into really a great week for the fans to be able to go to the Pro Bowl. Like when it's in Orlando, it's really a great fan experience for the fans. From what I understand, the players are very accessible. The NFL makes it that way. And you can go up, ask the guys autographs. They're walking around Disney there, and it's really a cool thing. So that's kind of how I envision this. But what's really crazy is now the National Football League, it, there's going to be no time off when it comes to the business of the NFL. You know, the NFL has just mastered this. They are so great at the business of football. You know, I would say this to you about Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball is so bad at the business of baseball. They're so bad at it. Because you know why? They don't market their players. I mean, Bryce Harper and Nolan Arenado or Manny Machado, if I lined them up in a crowd in a mall, there is no way, no way, 80% of the people that I can pick would know who any of those guys were. I mean, Mike Trout? Mike Trout has been stuck in Los Angeles with the Angels. I, I don't even remember the last time he's been to the postseason. None of the stars that you put in for how many, how many television commercials do you see guys doing that are for Major League Baseball? I mean, they're nowhere really publicly. Dep Major League Baseball is so bad at the business of baseball, where the NFL is just a master at the business of football. So now they're going to turn a combine. My only problem with this would be, listen, this is more of an intimate thing because there's interviews that you have to have with the player and the organization. You know, it's a serious thing because millions of dollars are on the line. You could go to the combines and be a projected third rounder. And if you kick so much ass at the combines, you could move yourself into the first round with your interview, with your performance, it's so important for the players and coaches to get a true evaluation on what the players can do, what they're like. It's a chance to be, you know, front and center with the player when you're talking to him on an interview. You get a chance to see him around uh, mingling with the rest of the franchises. So it's really an intimate setting for all the teams to watch the potential prospects that are going to go into the upcoming draft. So I hope that dynamic won't be taken away because that dynamic, those players are brought there, not for craps and giggles. Those players are bought there, uh, brought there because those players are trying to impress somebody to be able to get drafted into the National Football League. As long as you don't lose that dynamic. You know, it's funny. I hear people saying, well, you know, we can't really make this thing. Well, you have to make this thing into a business because you know why? The more you make this into a business, the more profitable it is for the NFL players. Another revenue stream goes into the player's pocket. Another revenue stream goes into the NFL, which makes the, which makes the sport an even bigger sport in America. Don't be so narrow-minded with things. You know, it's the old guy, get off my lawn, dude. Get off my lawn, man. You know, the old dude that lives next to you? Get off my lawn, dude. Or the guy who's on the radio still talks about like, you know, Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle and those guys. Dude, nobody today knows who Mickey Mantle is. Nobody cares. Okay? You know, I mean, you know, back when I was covering sports, you know, Mickey Mantle. Who? Mickey what? Dude, are you kidding me? Didn't you drive like a horse to work when Mickey Mantle was working? I mean, right? You get that old guy. Open your mind here to the possibilities of more money for these players to be able to make when you open it up to a fan experience, these combines. I think this is a good thing. 
I don't think this is a bad thing here. I think this is an opportunity for people to be able to say, okay, another fan experience. And by the way, you know what this else does too? This also makes the fan. I'll tell you one thing NASCAR does that's just brilliant, or they used to. That is, man, those drivers were always accessible. NHL to some extent too. Always accessible, always promoting their sport. The more the fans can get closer to the players, intermingle with the players, the more they have in common with these guys, the more relatable it becomes. And you know what else? It, it becomes that the fans, the players, coming out of a pandemic especially, you start to build that, that bond. You increase your fan base. More people are buying merchandise. Hey, maybe, get this, maybe I can't go to the Combines this year, but maybe I can go to the, to, to the Pro Bowl this year and go to the fan experience at the Pro Bowl. You now have things in the calendar. Watch this. Check it out. This is the offseason of the NFL. I guarantee you pretty soon they're going to come up with something when it comes to free agency. Like they'll have the top free agents like in New York City or something, and there'll be like deals being done. Congratulations, you now are a member of – you know what I'm saying? Watch this. So you, come, you have the combines. Then you have pro days. Don't be shocked if they don't start doing stuff around pro days. Then you have the draft. These are all benchmarks in the offseason. And by the time – get this. And by the time you get through the draft, the NFL training camps are around the corner. And from what I'm understanding this year – they're going to be opening up so many camps to the fans because the fans didn't have the experience a year ago of being able to show up to training camps because of COVID. So, dude, fans are going to be so welcomed back into the NFL, and it's going to start in training camp. So this combine idea is phenomenal. They're going to be sending it out to bids for all teams. Hey, Dallas Cowboys, do you want to host the NFL combines? At Jerry's World, <laughs> how great is that? That would be phenomenal. All right. We're going to catch up with Jeff Lagerman from the Jacksonville Jaguars. He's part of the broadcast team, and we'll get his thoughts on the 2021 season. That'll be next. You keep it here on the National Football Show. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say, But as I always say, It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods. Your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org.
field of life, First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. Welcome back to the National Football Show. Dan Cilio here for you. We're going to catch up with our friend Jeff Lagman, part of the broadcast team for the Jacksonville Jaguars, here in a second. Got some news this morning. And I think this is really great news when it comes to the Carl Nassib story. Carl Nassib, in case you've been under a rock, is the first active gay player in the National Football League. Plays for the Oakland Raiders slash uh, Los Angeles Raiders, now the Las Vegas Raiders. So he has decided to come out and be a leader for his cause, which is great. By the way, anytime somebody has conviction for what they believe in, I support it 100%. Long as it's not something that's got hatred behind it, I will be behind you 100%. And this is a great thing here. Good for him. I love anybody that stands on their convictions and stands behind them. And even with all the collateral damage that he potentially could take, um, he's standing strong and tall. It's been a really great outpour of love, the NFL, the Raiders, everybody. And here's something else, the fans. On Fanatic's website, the number one selling jersey right now is Carl Nassib and his jersey of the Las Vegas Raiders. That's a great sign because you know why? Listen, if you don't think the National Football League doesn't sway to the court of public opinion, you're absolutely crazy. How many times have we seen the court of public opinion change the narrative of the NFL's direction when it comes to issues? The whole thing with Ray Rice, that situation was changed overnight. Remember what the initial was? It came out that they were only going to give him a two-game suspension. You got more games off for smoking weed than you did punching a woman in the face. NFL was getting killed on social media for that. So what did they do? The NFL rolled back, pulled him off the field, gave him a, a year suspension. We never saw Ray Rice again. Same thing with Adrian Peterson. They got out in front of that, and it ended up costing them because they didn't handle that situation right. So the NFL is watching this now. And to see the court of public opinion, today at least, on June 24th, saying this, hey, listen, man, we support this 100%. Not that I didn't think anyone would. Who wouldn't support somebody standing for who you are? I mean, I don't care if you like the guy's sexuality or his politics or whatever. It's not important. What you should like is, is that, like I said, somebody's standing up for who they are. I mean, come on, man. What do you want people to do? Lie who they are? Of course not. That's not somebody you want to be friends with. That's not somebody you want to follow. That's actually somebody you don't want to work with. That's somebody you don't want in your locker room. All of that stuff plays a factor, man. Make no mistake about it. And to see the league now going like this, well, the guy's jersey's number one. And what's going to happen now? Nike's going to get behind this. You're going to have so much goodwill now. The question will be how much goodwill before it gets torn down again. If the league is smart, they will do everything in their power to manage this story. I don't think you could just let this story just run wild. Because it could go off in so many different angles. Like I told you before, I really do believe that Colin Kaepernick had in his mind that he was really talking about social injustices and police brutality. I really believe that he was thinking that. 
But then when you started talking about kneeling and the flag became involved in it, the majority of the football fan didn't see it that way. What did I tell you the majority of the football fan is? They're middle of America in the South. They're not New York and Los Angeles. They're not the New England area. They're not the Northeast. They're middle America and the South. Basically, they're Trump's base. And most people couldn't see. Well, how don't you see what Kaepernick's talking about? He's not really even talking about the national anthem. It didn't matter. You know, I tell people this all the time, especially young people trying to get into broadcasting. You may have a really good take on something. Okay? You may have a great take on something. But when you say it and you try conveying it, instead of landing here, it lands over here. And then you have a different story. Yeah, but I didn't mean that. Well, that's on you. Because you're the orator. You're the person that has to. That's why I tell people, look at what I do. I, 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 I write notes down now. And I put, I put important words down. I put as many words down as I possibly can when I'm preparing for a show. Because I want to make sure that what I'm saying, I want to make sure that my spin ends up landing exactly where I want you to feel me and for us to be able to have a conversation. Now, I'm not suggesting that you have to agree with everything that I say, but what I'm telling you is I like it that way when people have the ability to be able to listen to what we're saying here and then they understand what I'm saying because, again, not everybody can do that. Hey, Drew Brees tried to do that too. Remember last summer what he did? He said, hey, man, I'll never kneel for the national anthem. What happened? He ended up getting killed on social media. Drew Brees, of all people, being called a racist? Are you kidding me? Really? How crazy was that? So, I mean, make no mistake about it. That's the kind of stuff that you want to keep an eye on when it comes to this Carl Nassib story. I think it's a fantastic story. I think it's a great story. And make no mistake about it. The NFL keeps seeing these positive little tidbits being pushed out. Number one jersey, top story, everyone's embracing it. Um, other leagues, mainstream media is also embracing it. That's a good thing. So make no mistake about it. I'm glad to see this story. And it's just a couple of days after him announcing that he was gay. So good for them, man, and good for the NFL and getting everything ready. All right. You know, one of my favorite people that does a broadcast for a NFL team is Jeff Lagerman. I think they have one of the best broadcast teams there covering that team. My friend Tony Baselli also there, and he does a great job with that football team. It is Jeff Lagerman. Jeff, how you doing, brother? Thank you for doing this. Sure, Dan. Uh, thanks for having me, man. The excitement level in Jacksonville this year, and it's unlike I would think any other year. Do you feel it? Oh my gosh! Uh, yeah, I mean it's uh, it, it, it's amazing because you know Dan, we're starting to get getting back to a little bit of normalcy here in Florida and Jacksonville with COVID nineteen and everything. So you're you're starting to be out, and now that we're starting to be out, you're starting to encounter a lot of different people, and the level of excitement that the people have is incredible. I mean, you add first off, you add a, a proven coach in Urban Meyer who's won everywhere he's ever been from Bowling Green, Utah, Florida, Ohio State. And then you add the first overall pick to the draft to that, and uh, it just gets it, it gets heated, and people are excited. They're ready for football, and after last year's season where they were one in fifteen, to have so much momentum going into twenty twenty one with the change that's happened within the organization, it's pretty exciting. And I can tell you, I can tell you this: the last couple of years have, have been tough for me personally, just because you see where they're at, and you just you don't see the light. Well, now that you have Urban Meyer and you have Trevor Lawrence, yeah, I'm starting to see the light. I'll tell you this, Jeff. You and I know this, that when you got a guy like Urban Meyer in the building, I mean, Gator football in that neck of the woods there, you know, I covered sports there for now over 20 years, and I played my college football in that state. And when you're in that neck of the woods, then you bring a two-time national champion coach in. We had Jimmy Johnson on our show a couple weeks ago, Jeff, and he was saying he's constantly in contact. What did you do, coach? What did you – how did you make that transition? Do you think Urban's ready for it? Oh, yeah. I, I, look, I, I'm a big believer – and that if Urban were coaching Little League Baseball, 
he's going to win. I mean, a, a successful coach or a good coach is a good coach no matter what he does. Urban could coach soccer and, and be a good coach. I mean, I'm just a big believer in that leaders of men are leaders of men, and it doesn't matter what it's about. So uh, I'm excited about that aspect of it. And I think there's going to be still a little bit of an adjustment period, but it's not like he's a one man band. You've got a support staff around you and he's got a nice blend of college and pro experience on his staff to say, we're going to going to be able to help him uh, with the adjustment throughout the regular season. So I like his chances and, uh, and I like his leadership. And, you know, when you watch him throughout the off season and some of the training camp practices, the way that he goes about business, the way that he wants the best of the best for every player so that they can increase their value. And he uses that term quite a bit. And I think it sells the players that, listen, believe in what we're doing because it's not only going to help us as a football team, it's going to help you as an individual increase your value. When, when you increase your value, you help us, but you also help yourself. And so that's been exciting and it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different approach. And if Urban's talking to Jimmy, look, I know Jimmy, Dan, you know Jimmy. Jimmy is as successful as there has ever been and ever will be when it comes to college coaches that make the transition to the pro game. And so he's talking to the right man. How about this too, Jeff? One of the things Jimmy brought up that he thought that would give Urban a real great advantage, which the same thing that basically Pete Carroll and Jimmy went through was that they evaluated all these top college kids uh, that were in college. And you may not have to worry about getting a first rounder, but maybe somebody in the fourth or fifth round that you know is a first round talent, but maybe because he's a half inch too short, you know, those metrics, they always play out when it comes to the draft. That's got to be an advantage for him also when it comes to evaluating free agents and also potential players he wants on that roster. Do you agree? I think it helps not much, so much from a, from a talent standpoint, but I think it helps from the standpoint of when you're, when you're trying to build an organization, you need to have the right mindset with the people that you bring in. And so he has some familiarity with some of the people that he's bringing in because he does have a little bit of exposure to some of these guys through the college system. So I think that will help. But the talent evaluation part, that's got to come from the general manager. And Trent Baalke has had great success in the past as a general manager when he teamed up with Harbaugh with the San Francisco 49ers. He did a really good job out there. And so Trent Baalke being the general manager here in Jacksonville, teaming that up with Urban Meyer with some experience that he's got in college and a staff that, uh, that uh, Trent Baalke has been able to put together. You know, So uh, I, like, I like what I'm seeing so far. How about this too, Jeff? Um, the owner investing in Urban by upgrading all the facilities. You know, all the stuff that the players you were talking about, Urban wants the best for his guys, and he wants to make sure that they get the best. That's got to be quite a boost for the people in the community too to see that the owner, again, not suggesting in any way, I'm not talking move and stuff here. I'm talking about, wow, the owner's been, he's been motivated to upgrade everything. Is that how you see it too? When you get the number one pick and you get the number one pick in coaches to come to your organization, he had to up his game a little bit. Well, I think anybody that, uh, it, as far as ownership goes, when, when you get somebody like an urban Meyer who comes to you and he's coming from the college game where there's essentially the arms race when it comes to facilities. And he's saying, Hey, look, if, if we're going to compete, it's not about just recruiting. For us and for me, it's also about making sure that we're maximizing the value and the, pro the productivity of the players that we have here. And if we can provide them with a great facility and all the tools necessary, we're going to be a better football team. And one thing I think that a lot of people from the outside looking in think that Shad Khan, the owner of the Jaguars, was never committed to Jacksonville or is not committed to Jacksonville because the Jaguars play in London. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth when it comes to Shad Khan and the ownership and his commitment to Jacksonville because the owner has been committed in a partnership with the city on stadium bills and also extracurricular things that are around the city or around the stadium that are extra peripheral. So whether it be a Daly's Place where it's a live music venue they have wrestling events at AEW there. They're talking about the development of the riverfront in Jacksonville. And they're also now talking about the upgrades in the facility, which is what you're referring to. And they want to build a 
completely new detached facility that is attached to their practice field, but separate from the stadium, because right now all of the Jaguars facilities are right inside the stadium. So there's no question that Jaguars owner, Shad Khan, is committed to the city of Jacksonville, and he's committed to winning. He's never shied away from putting money up. Look at the video boards in Jacksonville at, at the stadium. It is the largest video boards in the world, and that was a partnership with the city at TIA Bank Field. You know, Trevor Lawrence, um, the excitement level for him being brought in. I've said this to Jeff that I think he's the number one topic or number one prospect that I've seen come into the NFL, maybe since John Elway, maybe Andrew Luck. And I I'm just talking about his resume in college. Obviously, that's got to translate into the NFL. But am I wrong when I say that? And again, I'm not comparing him to those players. I'm just comparing what and how we saw John Elway and Andrew Luck when they came out of college and I see the same thing. And the most important thing for me is the guy won with that great ability. John didn't win at Stanford. Okay. This kid won at Clemson and won big time at Clemson. Am I right when I'm saying all this? Yeah. It, it, uh, and if there was ever anybody that was prepared for the spotlight that the NFL is going to bring, it's going to be Trevor Lawrence because the spotlight has been on him essentially since he was growing up as a kid and went to high school and then he goes to Clemson and he wins a, a national title early on in his young career at Clemson. And now obviously the first overall pick in the draft, I think you're dead on the money. And when you look at the film and look, I, I haven't studied quarterbacks for 20 years or anything like that. So it's not like I was watching film on John Elway, but I was watching film of Andrew Luck. I was watching film of Patrick Mahomes. And watching Andrew Luck, Patrick Mahomes, and Trevor Lawrence, those are the three guys that I've watched on college film that I felt were, were without a doubt, the most NFL-ready quarterbacks that I have ever seen. Patrick Mahomes, so much, not so much from the winning wins and losses standpoint in college, but the way that he could throw the football, his arm was magical. When you watch Trevor Lawrence, his fundamentals are so – I don't want to say perfect because nobody's perfect. His fundamentals are so solid. When most people get to the NFL, the coaches are still working with a lot of fundamentals about footwork and how your shoulders are and where your arms are and where your off arm is and where your feet placement is and where you're stepping, how many steps you're taking. When you watch him play in practice and also when I say play in, in, at the college level when he was at Clemson, his footwork is impeccable. And when you watch him in the OTAs and the mini camp that I had an opportunity to watch him in, his footwork is so perfect that when he makes the routine throws, a lot of people take routine throws for granted, but ball placement on routine throws is everything. Because if a receiver can catch it and it's at the perfect placement, he's allowed to end up essentially gaining more yards after catch and doing better things with his body after the catch because the ball placement is perfect. And with Trevor Lawrence, his ball placement is, is fantastic. And some of the more difficult throws, obviously he can do that. And it's all because of his feet and his body and his talent. And obviously he's not going to come out of the gate and just light the world up. I mean, if you look at history, even Peyton Manning only won three games. Troy Aikman won one game as a rookie. And we're talking about Hall of Famers right there. So is Trevor Lawrence going to struggle? Yeah, he's probably going to have moments where he struggles. But I don't think he's going to struggle as much as maybe those guys did, mainly because they're probably going to end up incorporating, like a lot of NFL teams are doing now with college quarterbacks, they're probably going to incorporate a little bit of that read option pass and some of the things about using his legs to end up taking some of the pressure off to actually drop back into a pocket and just sit, sit there and read a defense. So I think that's going to help Trevor Lawrence is his mobility. Jeff, you know, I, I, I mentioned, you know, and I was so glad to hear you say that the ownership is committed into having that football team in Jacksonville. And I'll even add this and tell me if you think I'm off base here. You know, I, I've said this before in the past. Can you imagine if Eli Manning did end up going to San Diego and what that would have meant to the San Diego Chargers if they would have won two championships? That would have kept that team, in my opinion, in San Diego. They would have had themselves a stadium. They would have built the stadium there. They would have had a massive amount of winning. Now, I'm just taking what he did in New York and I'm just having a maybe a pipe dream on what would have happened with the Spanos family in San Diego. But I'm thinking to myself, when you have somebody like that, that gifted, the pressures that Lawrence has to feel, because in that neck of the woods, like I told you, Jeff, that's gator country. He's going to maybe change the face of that entire area by saying, no, 
it's Jaguar country now. So there's more pressure than just getting out there and playing on Sundays. Yeah, the, the one thing for certain, Dan, when you when you look at the ratings and a lot of people think, okay, Jacksonville is still kind of a college market because of Florida and Florida State. Well, the reality is if you look at the ratings, it's the Jaguars market. But okay, the Jaguars, good. The Jaguars just need a win. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, it's it probably helped the Jaguars a little bit stay on top when it comes to the ratings because, look, Florida it hasn't been outstanding. They've gotten better, certainly, of, of late. Florida State is struggling in a big way, but uh, but look, the Jaguars are are still king. They just got to win. You, know, you go back to what they did in 2017 when they were just a maybe a bad call away from being in the Super Bowl and beating Tom Brady up in New England, okay? Because Miles Jack wasn't down with that fumble. I mean, it could have completely changed the dynamic of how people view the Jaguars organization. So, look, the, the fans are ready to support this football team, and this football team just needs to do its part and win some football games. Two last questions for you. Okay, how good can this team be? And I, I'm not asking you to do the stupid stuff by giving me a record or anything here. <laughs> I mean, just tell me how you look at the roster right now because as you and I know, Jeff, in that league, the war of attrition can always end up at the end of the day helping you maybe be a surprise team at the end of the day because if you don't have the roster, I don't care what your front 22 guys are. One injury away, the Rams are finished, in my opinion, because they don't have the depth. How good is this Jag roster? Uh, I, I think it's still – I think it's, it's going to be good enough to be competitive in 2021. And I think it's going to be good enough to take a major step up. When you look at some of the, the – the, the wide receiver group on offense is very solid, especially with an addition and free agency. The running back group with Travis Etienne, you're talking some easy completions for the quarterback. J. Rob, James Robinson, who emerged last year as a running back. The offensive line group is all returning. I think it's an okay group that has the ability to get better. So offensively with a young quarterback, you've got the ability to run the football and you've got a talented wide receiver group. And Marvin Jones is the addition and free agency at wide receiver. And defense, that's where I think there's still some work to do. The defensive line, they added some guys in free agency, but how talented are they? That's a great question. We're going to have to wait and see. They've added some players in the back end and the secondary in free agency. They also added some in the draft. The linebacking group with Joe Schobert and Miles Jack is solid. But it's up front is a big question mark. You know, Josh Allen returns, but Josh Allen is coming off a year that he was hurt and he wasn't very productive. And then Caleb on Chazon, who was a first-round pick last year, didn't have a whole lot of productivity. So there's a lot of questions still with this roster and parts of this roster. But the one thing I think that will definitely happen, this team will take a big step up, and it will take a big step up to the point where they're competitive week in and week out. And last year, you couldn't say that. Many games last year, this team was not competitive, and you never saw that they were going to be competitive any time in the near future. So that's going to be, I think, a big step. You, know, you, you, you can't build a franchise in one year. You know, and the, even though you add an Urban Meyer and a Trevor Lawrence in one year, it all, doesn't all of a sudden just make you an instant winner. I think this team is probably two years away from competing. When I say compete, I'm talking about competing for playoffs. I think this year, though, is going to be a big step up and a big building year for this organization. Finally here, Jeff, I, I left this to the last question because I think he's the last guy on the roster. And quite frankly, no disrespect to Tim Tebow as a man. <laughs> I, I, I really, you and I know this, 13 tight ends. This is maybe the most famous 13 tight end that I've ever seen in my life. But it's funny, everyone asks me my opinion. I don't really care because if he can help the team win, more power to him. And I asked Coach Johnson, why would he bring in a guy like Tebow? He goes, Tebow's going to help everybody in that locker room understand the kind of culture that Urban Meyer wants to have in that locker room. So every single kind of person, either Ohio State, either at Utah, wherever those guys have ever been, where Urban Meyer was, Urban Meyer had a type of culture. Tebow knows that culture better than anybody. So his strength to the team is telling people what's expected of the team under Urban Meyer. Do you agree with that? And if he can play, he makes a roster spot. Am I right with Tebow? Well, if he can play, and and obviously we haven't had an opportunity to see him in pads, and that's going to be able to say a lot. And we're talking about a 33-year-old guy who's making a position switch who's been playing baseball of recent past. So, I mean, it's going to be a stretch to expect him to make the football team. And when you watch him in the OTAs, I think he's got a long way to go. And if you look at him just from a sheer ranking in the tight end group, uh, he's probably somewhere near the bottom right now. 
And so he's got a lot of ground to make up, but he's also been out of football and away from football for a very long time. I'm a big believer when a coach comes in, you have to have people that believe in your system and people that know your system than people that can carry your message. Jimmy was no different. When Jimmy went to the Cowboys, how many guys from the U ended up playing for the Dallas Cowboys early on? It was a was bunch there. of them. That's right. It was a bunch of them because he wanted to surround himself with guys that knew his message, that knew how he wanted to conduct his business. And it translated and permeated throughout the team by having guys like that. So if Urban Meyer thinks that, that Tim Tebow can help him with that messaging, awesome. If Tim Tebow can play good football, maybe make a football team, great. Do I think it's likely? I don't. But I also think it's going to be of great benefit, I think, to be able to have a guy like that who is a hardworking guy who does things the right way and who's proven that many times over to have a guy like that in the locker room. I'm a big fan of Tim Tebow when it comes to that because he does things the right way, especially when we see too many examples of guys that do it the wrong way. Absolutely. So you're not a fan of helmets and shorts and telling everybody, well, that guy's really great. Every, I, you know what, Jeff, every time I, I, someone asks me, they go, Hey, did you hear what they said about Justin Fields up in Chicago? I go, the guy's in a helmet and shorts, dude. Everybody looks good in helmets and shorts. And if you don't, you should be cut. <laughs> I, I will say this, you know, when, 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 when the first time that I saw Tim, it comes out to the practice and it was the very first practice that was open to the broadcast media and, and even our own broadcast team. And so we're out there on practice field. Of course, everybody's looking for number 85 because people are wondering that's the number that he's wearing. He's not wearing 15 with the Jaguars. He's wearing 85. So all of a sudden 85 comes walking out. And the first thing I thought was, gosh, he's not very tall. You know, because if you compare him to the other tight ends, I'm like, well, he's, he's a little short. But then I saw the guns and how thick he was. I'm like, that dude right there has been working out. And he hasn't been swinging a baseball bat in a while. He's been in the gym swinging dumbbells and barbells. I mean, he's, he's, I mean, he's big now. He's big. <laughs> yeah, but, but Jeff just said you can eat a bowl of soup off his head. <laughs> <laughs> he's not real tall. I mean, you can tell the other guys, yeah. He, he more, he, honestly, if, if you were to if you take all the numbers off of him, you say, okay, this guy right here, he's an offensive player. What do you think he plays? Most people would say fullback. And, and I don't say that to be funny. I mean, because, you know, when you compare him to some of the other tight ends in that group, I mean, he's just, he's just not that tall. Which, look, many, many tight ends that weren't very tall were pretty good in the league, and I'm not saying he's going to be good, but uh, he's not very tall. <laughs> hey, Jeff. Thank you, man. Really great stuff, man. It's so great catching up with you, brother. Thank you so much, man. All right. Thank you, Dan. You got it. Jeff Lagerman, the broadcaster with the Jacksonville Jaguars. They got a great broadcast team. All right. We'll take a quick time out. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say... But as I always say... It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest... Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods. Your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. 
IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's Army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. Dan Cilio, National Football Show. Hope you're having a great day. Hate Thursdays, though, you know? Day before Friday. You know what I mean, right? Like the worst day of the week, kind of. So, I don't know. Thank God we have sports. All right. Um, real quick here. I, I, I saw that the local authorities there in Miami dropped the charges against Antonio Brown for his battery case. And my first initial thought was, wow, how lucky can that get? A year ago, or maybe a year and a half ago, AB's not getting that latitude. Why do you think that is? Because he's building up equity again. And there's only one guy that's responsible for putting the pieces and putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. You know who that is? Tom Brady. Tom Brady took the pieces that were on the floor shattered with Antonio Brown Nobody wanted to take a shot at the guy. Nobody wanted to take a chance. Everyone knows how talented he is. Hell, he's one of the greatest wide receivers ever in the history of the sport if you look his numbers up. I mean, I think only Jerry Rice had more catches and more yards at that particular time in his career. He may even have had more catches than Rice. I mean, Antonio Brown was on his way to punch his ticket to Canton, Ohio. He has a Hall of Fame career still within his grasp. But funny, sometimes on the way to the octagon, you end up acting like Bones Jones and can't get there, right? For numerous reasons. You just can't get there. There's some reason. You know, Dana White loves him. He loves Jones, right? Jones just can't get to the octagon. Speeding, drugs, performance-enhancing drugs. How many times has that guy just absolutely lit a blowtorch to his career? We see it. How about Tyson? How he lit it to his career. Tiger Woods, in some aspect, took a blowtorch to his career. You know, I mean, we see it all the time. There's A, B in pieces. One guy comes to the rescue. Tom Brady. Remember last year at the beginning of the year, Bruce Arians was asked the question, hey, man, and by the way, you can go back and listen to my interview with Bruce Arians. And Bruce just says, hey, man, Antonio Brown is one of my favorite people that we have in our roster, and he's just great with the young players. But remember what he said at the beginning of the year last year? He was going like this. I don't want anything to do with the guy. We don't need him. We're loaded. And Bruce was right because you know why? Get this. Tom Brady really hadn't built up enough equity with Bruce Arians, which was really – a great way to go about building a relationship. Bruce didn't take what he was being told about Tom in New England and all the accomplishments he had in New England. That didn't matter to Bruce. You're coming to work in my building. You can have all the... Are we going to be able to work together? Most importantly, am I going to be able to trust you? 
And what ends up happening? Brady starts winning. Brady starts showing what kind of teammate he is. Bruce Arians bent. All right. Let's go to Jason Light and see if we can work it out where we bring Antonio Brown in. What happened? Antonio Brown was on his best behavior. Antonio Brown was the last guy signed because you know what? He thought he could go out into the open market and thought he was going to get like 6 or $7 million a year. And no NFL team was actually ringing that doorbell. They were a little suspect on that number, right? They were like, no, I don't think so. If he was ever going to come back with the same number, it was going to be in Tampa or around that number. He was never not going to not come back to Tampa. But if somebody would have given him that, and I'm thankful that he didn't do that, you need to kiss Tom Brady's ass every single day. Because now authorities and people around the country are going, hey, maybe AB has straightened his life out. Maybe he's just straightened it out. But that's all because of TB12. Tom Brady has made it so that this guy's now building his equity back up where maybe he actually rolls into Canton, Ohio as a Hall of Fame wide receiver. Can you imagine he have two Super Bowl rings on his finger and all those yards and catches? He will get there. All right. I want to make a comment about Mike Tomlin. I've said this before, and I'll bury the lead. Mike Tomlin's my favorite coach. But hour two, keep it right here on the National Football Show. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say. But as I always say. It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods, your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's Army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. Hour two, Dan Silio here on the National Football Show. In this hour, we're going to try to run down our friend Ice Cube, get his thoughts on everything sports-related, his big three 
basketball. He and Amy Trask have put together what I think is one of the best basketball leagues there is. And now even big three basketball is an Olympic sport. We'll talk to him. All things Raiders, too. You know he's a huge uh, Raider fan. And on top of that, a huge football fan. So we hope to catch up with him. That'll be at the bottom of the hour. You know, I, I, I say this all the time watching how this story is playing out in Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers. And I always come back to the gold standard of Tom Brady. Brady's the gold standard when it comes to how you need to act as a quarterback. Really is. You know, I said this a couple days ago about Dak Prescott. You know, if you're looking at how you are as a young player and the things that you want, and if you're the quarterback of a particular NFL team, you can't go wrong with the character of Dak Prescott. Dak wears that star with great pride. Dak works his ass off. Dak continues to get better. And most importantly, everyone in his locker room loves him. It's almost like Dak Prescott has taken a page out of Tom Brady's manual because that's exactly the manual Brady has. What was the number one thing that Tom Brady wanted when he got to Tampa and all the paperwork was signed, sealed, and delivered? He wanted all the phone numbers for all the players on the roster, and he called every single one of those players and let them know, hey, I'm looking forward to playing with you. Hey, I'm looking forward to going to training camp. Let's make this a very special year. Brady wanted to get to know each and every single person inside that locker room. You know, when Aaron Rodgers is playing the ukulele in Hawaii and throwing darts and throwing little innuendos at the Packers, Brady's preparing himself for an upcoming season. You know what's crazy? Brady probably prepares harder today than he ever did back even when he was in his first two years because there's more pressure on Brady now. You don't think Brady prepares harder today? I do. You know, we, we were talking about Ben Simmons and all the issues going on with the point guard for the 76ers. You think that guy works any harder today than he did when he first initially came into the league? No. His game shows it. He hasn't improved. He hasn't improved in any way. Oh, maybe because he's an NBA guy. But on top of that, he's not improved his game. His shot still sucks. He's horrible at the charity stripe. He's not gotten better. Look at how Tom Brady has improved himself every single year he's played. You know those stupid notions, deflate gate and spy gate? This was just media made stuff that was trying to derail the guy's legacy. It really had no bearing on anything when it came to Brady's success, did it? Because after every one of those, I guess, media scandals, that's what I'll call them. After every one of those media scandals, what happened? Tom Brady won a Super Bowl. And nobody could really bring that stuff up. Everyone goes, oh, these guys are cheap. Didn't matter. They still won after that. How many Super Bowls did they win after Spygate? You truly think? See, I, I, I always look back at that stuff, and I always looked at it. Well, the Patriots are the modern-day Raiders. The Raiders are the people that used to turn on the sprinklers. You know, when a fast team used to come into the Alameda Colli uh, County Coliseum and like Al Davis would turn on sprinklers if he thought that team was faster than his. And everyone would go, wait a minute. There was no rain here in Northern California. Al goes, oh, the sprinklers must have broke. Yeah, right. You wanted a slow field so you could have that team as fast as your team. Al was uh, notorious for doing that. And that's what the Patriots are notoriously known for doing, too. You know, there was a notion that this is really totally Belichick. So do you know what they stopped the Patriots from doing? So you know the pregame. You know, Sean McDermott, he caught on to it, and he called the league office on it. So you know the cheerleaders for the Patriots, they wouldn't do any warm-ups when the Patriots were on the field prior to game time. But when the opposing team came out for stretching prior to, like, the game, the New England Patriot cheerleaders would come out and they would, like, perform right around where the players were prepping. And finally, McDermott was like, how come this – what is this? Get this out of here. 
And every coach started realizing that the Patriots had always done that. Just small things, just to take your mind one second off the game. Some of you would probably go, do you really? Just the little bit and the littlest things. Because what do the little things make you think of? Big things. Gee, are they bugging the locker room next? Are they, are, 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 are they doing that? Are they? Is everything, like, good, you know? Right? So, bottom line, man. Uh, you, the littlest thing will make you think. So I love that stuff. I love that gamesmanship, man. We just got a great text from uh, our boy Ice Cube. He's rocking and rolling. He'll be ready to rock at the bottom of the hour with us. So all good, man. So looking forward to that. All right, let me get into a conversation with um, and about Mike Tomlin. I've had this conversation with Krause and how much we love Mike Tomlin. My time will put your ass on blast. Okay. Doesn't matter in any way whatsoever who you think you are, what you think you are, the things that you may think your game's about. End of the day, man, Mike Tom will put your ass on blast. And that includes Ben Roethlisberger. That's what makes that franchise so great is that Ben doesn't care. Uh, hey, he'll, he'll hear you and go, damn, I just got to sit here and take this stuff, man. Ben don't care to get up and try to challenge Mike Tomlin because nobody challenges Mike Tomlin. Mike Tomlin's a great coach. By the way, do I think Mike Tomlin is a Hall of Fame coach? I do. I think if you think that Bill Cowher is a Hall of Fame coach, you have to think that Mike Tomlin's a Hall of Fame coach. Went just as many Super Bowls. He's won more games, actually. But here could be the rub. And you know what? I hate doing this because I pointed this out earlier when it came to Kyle Shanahan. And just to refresh, I made the point, the 49er coach. So the 49ers coach's overall record is 29 and 35. And in the four years, him being in San Francisco, if you take the 2019 season away, the team is 16 and 32. And three of the four seasons that he's been the head coach have been losing seasons. Is that a successful coach? Right? Like Parcell says, you are what your record says. So how do I evaluate that and then turn around and give you this number? In the last nine years, Mike Tomlin with the Pittsburgh Steelers is three and six in the postseason since 2011, and he's missed four seasons of postseason football in those nine years. Is Mike Tomlin underachieving in Pittsburgh with that roster? Remember, he did have Le'Veon Bell. Remember, he did have Antonio Brown. Ryan Chazier was on that team. Roethlisberger has put together a Hall of Fame career. Three and six in nine years. Okay, three and six. Think of that. Since 2011, that's his postseason record. Okay? That's not a lot of winning. Tebow beat him in the postseason. Okay? Hey, man. Bottom line here is, is Mike Tomlin winning enough in Pittsburgh? I just got through talking about Kyle Shanahan. He is what his record is. When you look at this record here, Mike Tomlin, nine years, last nine years, postseason, three and six. You know, do I think the Steelers, watch this, do I think the Steelers this year are a contender for the AFC Championship? No, I don't. No, I don't think they are. I think they're going to be right in the middle. They'll be a 10 and 7 team, maybe an 11 and 6 team, something in that room. But do I think they can catch magic and, now, look, I'll tell you this, though. Here, here's, here's the telling factor for the Steelers this coming season. I would say this to you. When you add Najee Harrison to that offensive huddle, the Alabama running back they drafted in the first round, let's do this here with that. What was the number one issue a year ago that the Pittsburgh Steelers had? What was the number one issue? They couldn't really do anything in the red zone. Their third and one was awful last year 
And that's why they fell to pieces. I think they were one in five over the last six ball games of the season. They won on that consecutive games uh, winning streak, but nobody really thought that that was real. They thought they were kind of paper champions with the teams that they had beaten during that streak. Nobody went, you know, that looks like it's going to be one of those iconic teams that we saw in years past. Now, if Najee Harris can go in there and give any kind of Derrick Henry performance, that football team will look almost the same way as what John Elway's Denver Broncos look like. Think of this for a second. And I really love what Kevin Colbert, who's been on our program, has done here. Think about what Kevin Colbert did. Kevin Colbert said, okay, we have an aging quarterback here. And we know that he's not going to be able to throw this football team to too many wins. I'm not even sure that this guy can throw us out of trouble. But if we get a running game going, think about what they did now, remember, in Denver. Okay? Think of what they did in Denver. When John Elway was starting to run out of steam and starting to run out of gas, what did they do? They went and got themselves a running back or found themselves a running back in Terrell Davis. Changed John Elway's entire dynamic. He ends up winning those back-to-back world championships. Changed how we looked at John Elway's resume. You know, we forgot the other three losses that he had in Super Bowl play. And John Elway had something at the very end of the day that he never had at the beginning of his career was a coach that was really allowing him to be a coach on the field. And you never really had a defense or a running game. Mike Shanahan built an entire roster around not John Elway. He built that entire roster around Terrell Davis. And if Pittsburgh can do that, Pittsburgh's O-line is as good as it gets. Okay. It's as good as it gets. Their defense, T.J. Watt, dude, that Steeler defense, they get anything. If that team looks like the Denver Bronco team of years ago with Terrell Davis, that football team might win 12 ball games. And war of attrition playing into it, you never know what really happens with a football team. Okay? You, you just never really know. All right. Real quick before we get to a timeout and we get to Ice Cube at the bottom of the hour here. So the NFL Players Association and the NFL has come out saying that players, and again, follow me here. I'm going to make sure that I underscore this. I'm not telling you to get vaccinated or I'm not telling you to get vaccinated. I'm telling you a story that the NFL is covering right now and the NFL's procedures on what they're going to do for the upcoming season. You make your own assessment. Okay? This is a story, though. Players who like we just saw with Chris Paul have contact tracing and have to get put in the COVID protocol and may have to miss a game or some practice time until they get cleared will not miss a paycheck. Now, if you don't get vaccinated, I don't know how you're going to find that out. Are you actually going to ask the player if he has been vaccinated? That could be something that you may see in court. I don't know that a team has the right to ask you about your medical history. Now, some would say this, Dan, don't they have medical files on you inside the organization? Yes, but they don't have your personal health issues that are inside that locker room. They have things on you through their team doctors. You have a private physician. Why do you always hear the player getting a second opinion? on a neck injury or a knee injury or an elbow injury or what have you because they want their doctors to look at it and they don't want to be given any kind of different intel before they make their own assessment on what that particular injury is about. So here, my question would be this. You know, we're watching this Cole Beasley story, the wide receiver for the Buffalo Bills who's saying, I'm not getting vaccinated. It's his right. I'm not telling you to or not. I'm just, that's not something for me, okay? You, you figure that out yourself. Every American has a right to do whatever they feel like it. I'm not here to influence you in either way. It's not my job. I don't tell you how to live your life. Everybody's their own captain to their own steamship. I'm never going to be that guy, okay? I don't, you should live your life. That's not me. <laughs> I have enough, enough of a time living my own life, okay? Tr- truly when I tell you. I have enough <laughs> issues in my own life. 
me telling you how to live your life, that ain't happening. So the NFL, though, is trying to tell you how to live your life here a little bit. And they're doing it subtly with a paycheck. If you come down with something, and because you didn't get vaccinated, the National Football League is going to hold your paycheck back. I don't think that's going to fly in a court of law. I just don't think that flies. How are you going to get that by a judge when you're sitting there saying, okay, does that team, does that business have, and here's the issue. And here's the issue that Cole Beasley and Buffalo and the Players Association, everybody has to deal with. Now, the NFL is a private business. Do they have a right, you know, just like on the back of a check that you get from a restaurant, they have a right to serve whoever they feel like. Okay? They have a right to serve you or not serve you. Private businesses all have that in their right. I don't think they can go like this. Hey, I'd like to see your um, your voter registration card. You know what I mean? I don't think they have a right to do that. But they do have a right to serve whoever they feel like. Or, or can I see your vaccination card? You know, I don't know. I don't think that's legal. So the bottom line would be, how is the league going to push this through legally? And why wouldn't the NFL players, so the NFL Players Association, who is working in sequence with the league in this here, how are you going to protect your union base for guys who have not been vaccinated? That's going to be a very, very strong issue that I could see in a court of law. By the way, I would even ask this. How are you going to deal with that when it comes to fans rolling into your facilities? When people roll into the stadiums this coming fall or this coming summer when it comes to exhibition football, the Hall of Fame game's right around the corner. Um, how are you going to know whether or not these fans have been vaccinated or not? Do they have to show? Like, vo It's funny. So in some places, they don't want you to show voter ID, like in Atlanta. But now they want you to show vaccination ID. I mean, really? <laughs> okay, right? It's kind of crazy at how you look at it. Hey, you know what, man? You need to show me your, your vaccination ID. What about my voter ID? Nah, that's all right, man. How do you know what? How do you know that's me? Uh, no, nobody really cares. You know, it's an election. Who cares, right? Just make sure that one guy doesn't make it. We're good, <laughs> right? You're like, I don't know, man. Move the all-star game out for that same thing. So we'll see this coming fall. All right, we'll take a brief time out. You keep it right here on the National Football Show. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say. But as I always say. It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods. Your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. 
Learn more at IBEW98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's Army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. Welcome back to the National Football Show. Dan Cilio. We'll be talking to Ice Cube here in a couple seconds. I made a comment the other day about uh, the NCAA and this new 12-team playoff, and you see the NCAA, like, you know, coming up with new rules on how they're going to let the kids, you know, make money off their own image, off their own name. And you're sitting there thinking to yourself, wait a minute now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't Justin Ka- Justice Kavanaugh just come out and basically just destroy the NCAA when it came to that just exact notion that you can't legislate in any way whatsoever to tell these kids that they can't make money off their own name. And now you want to come up with these parameters and these guardrails for these kids to do it. You see, this is all about controlling the players again. You see, they want to control the game. And when you control the game, you control the players. But what's happening now is because of this new 12-team playoff that the college football committee is whatever, I guess, going over and previewing and kicking cans down the road, you know what's going to happen because of the amount of money that's involved in it. You know, they're projecting $70 million. Excuse me. (laughs) I got my M's wrong and B's wrong. $70 billion a year in college football revenue because of this 12-team college playoff. $70 billion. What business in America do you know where you don't have to pay employees and you're making $70 billion? And then you still come up with that stupid notion because you've painted it on a shield that says, hey, this is amateur sports. How do you even sell that trash any longer? Who in their right mind would believe that? That it's something to do with amateur sports. You know it has nothing to do with amateur sports, but yet still the college commissioners are coming up with a way that they could sit here and somehow legislate how kids can still make money off of their name. I mean, they want a piece of that too still. That's what the NCAA is trying to do. Even though the Supreme Court of the United States of America has sided with the players, the NCAA still wants their vig or their juice in what the players do when it comes to making money. Can you imagine, man, if you're a member of the USC Trojan football team, And you got USC Notre Dame or you got USC UCLA for that week. And you walk up to a car dealership and you just start doing this. Hey, I'd love to see if you'd sponsor me this week. You know, I'll do a bunch of podcasts. I'll do some social media stuff for you, whatever you need. If you could give me $2,000, it'd really be appreciated. Um, I'll help promote anything that you have here at your restaurant, your, you know, uh, your car dealership, your hotel, anything. Can you imagine, too, now if you're working up in Oregon and you're working on the Oregon Duck team? Look at the amount of money and the amount of uh, jobs that you can offer a kid 
with Nike because they got a great tie-in with Nike. If you go to school at Oregon now and you're allowed to make money off your likeness and your name, dude, you get a chance to make yourself a pretty good little salary there as a member of the Oregon Duck football team. Phil Knight donates all kinds of money to that football program. You don't think he'd like to have some people wearing sneakers and having the ability to go out and promote Nike? Not that they need it. They've got all the major stars. But still, you'd have Nike football kids making money on the Oregon Ducks football team. And you're, do you talk about a perk? Would that get me to go on a recruiting trip potentially to Oregon? Absolutely. All right. All that being said, I want to bring in my friend Ice Cube here, and I am so grateful that Cube jumps aboard with us here. Cube, thank you so much for coming aboard, my friend. How you doing, Cube? I can't hear him, man. Guys, see if we can get that. See if we can get that uh, fixed up there. We can get the audio working there too. See if we can get Ice Cube back here. Yeah, we, I've been dying to get him, man. I mean, we've been trying to go back and forth. He's got big three basketball, and it is out there now. And I know that, hey, look, they're looking so forward to it. Last year, um, they had an issue because of COVID, just like everyone else did. And they were able to, like, you know, weather through it. Cube was pounding through it. They still put some games on. I love the fact now that it's an Olympic sport. He's got one of the absolute best people working around him too. And that is Amy Trask. And I so love Amy. That's how Cube and I ended up meeting back in the day because Amy is one of my dearest friends and one of my longest friends. And I got a chance to work with Al Davis back in the day. And, you know, Cube is a big Raider fan too. So yeah, man, I mean, I am so happy. And I love the fact too, that big three basketball, you know what it does? It allows these veteran guys to still make money off of their name. And it is still allows people to like continue their dream. And Cube never wanted to see those guys just like kind of like as soon as the game was over, he never wanted to see that stuff just like kind of like die on the vine. Okay. Didn't want to see it like that. So what he did was he started big three basketball and he went forward with it and it has been a massive success. And we bring him back here. How you doing cube? Yo, what's up? Is that better? You bet, man. We're all plugged in now, man. How you doing cube? Oh man, I'm great, man. I'm real good. You know, the season is about to start. So, you know, we, we working hard, you know, but, uh, yo, we ready. Everybody's ready. You like to tell by your face, man, how excited you are about this. I mean, Cube, tell us a little bit getting through COVID last year. And I could tell by just your expression how excited you are about the 2021 season. What did you guys maybe learn going through that pandemic last year? Well, you know, um, we learned a lot. Every, I think everybody learned a lot about themselves. Um, everybody had to adjust. I mean, um, the entertainment industry was hit hard. Uh, so, you know, it was it was really about uh, figuring out, you know, what should we do? You know, we got to make our decisions about the big three in March and April. Um, so in March and April of 2020, it looked pretty bad. Nobody knew what the summer was going to hold. Uh, so we decided not to have a season. Um, of course, we, we had so much momentum going into the 2020 season. Uh, it hurt to not be able to play. But what it showed by coming back this year was the big three is here to stay. People love it. The, the players love to play. The fans love the game. Uh, our partners are excited. Uh, we've gained a lot of great partners. We're going to make some, some cool announcements uh, next week. And so um, it just shows that we put together something that can, you know, stand the test of time, at least stand the pandemic. So that's a good start. Was there any time where you went like this? Because I talked to Rock about, you know, he wanted to start maybe the XFL last year, but because of the pandemic, he didn't know about the economic resources coming out of that. 
You know, now they're talking about teaming up with the CFL. A lot of dynamics are going into that. And there was even a thought maybe they wouldn't even go forward. Did you have that thought with Big Three Hoop that, hey, man, because, Cube, you never really know what was going to happen through this whole thing. Was there a little doubt maybe getting back and placing them up again? No, I didn't have any doubt. I knew we had a great um, team who could hold the league together. Um, I knew that we had a sport that people are interested in. And I knew when I saw the NBA playing that sports was coming back, you know, it wasn't going to be forever. So I had no doubt that we would be playing this July. So to be back, I'm very happy. Uh, hopefully we have a lot of the, the pain of, of the pandemic uh, behind us and we can get back to, uh, you know, enjoying life, enjoying sports, enjoying entertainment and having fun. Absolutely. All right, Cube, it's an Olympic sport. Did you ever think, I mean, dude, yeah, this has got to be for you too with the Olympic games coming up. I mean, now big, now three, three man basketball is an Olympic event now. I mean, this has got to just be a great poster for your league as well when we're talking about something like this. Did you ever think that when you started it, it would grow to where it is today, even through the pandemic? Um, well, we were reading the tea leaves. Before we started the league, we saw how big three-on-three -three was around the world. Um, it's just now growing here in America, but in other countries – um, it's, it's big because they, you know, don't have the space or just have the history of putting up uh, these spectacular gymnasiums. So um, we had looked and saw that, you know, they were talking about it becoming an Olympic sport. And, um, and once, but we launched anyway before they made their decision. And it seemed like weeks after we, we uh, launched the big three, uh, the Olympic Committee decided to make three-on-three -three an Olympic sport. Uh, even though what we play is different than what, what you're going to see in the Olympics, uh, what you see in the Olympics is an is a amateur version of three-on-three. -three. It's what FIBA does, and we do the professional version of it. We even call it Fireball 3. So we're actually you know, not really worried about what they're doing with that sport in the Olympics. We're just worried about what the big three is doing. I got to tell you, man, I was I, my, my freshman year. I was friends with Led Bias and they, they all the guys, man. When I went, first went to Maryland before I went to the University of Miami and some of my guys like Adrian Bance were going like this. So I hear you getting cube on, man. You tell that dude, man, that's just Rutgers ball, dude. <laughs> you tell a big three hoop is just Rutgers ball, man. You saw oh, that ain't. stuff, silly. -o. <laughs> no, it ain't. So I'm gonna come down there and try to play. You know, it's, it's bigger than that. You know, I got I got pro athletes who play all over the world and playing at a very high level. So, you know, it's definitely uh, a level above Rucker League. You know, um, it, you know this is this is this version of of ball at the highest level. You know, there's nobody playing three on three bigger than the big three. Absolutely. Hey, Cube, do you like, speaking of hoop, the NBA and what the new faces are showing right now, you know, you watched Trey Young last night. I mean, you're seeing Giannis, whether or not he can deliver, you know, first guy in Milwaukee since Jabbar in 74. Now we're seeing like the Clippers. I know I know what you think of the Clippers making the Eastern Co or Western Conference finals. you got that Suns team with, 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 with Chris Paul. He's back tonight. Do you like to see the new blood? that getting a chance maybe to go after the Larry O'Brien trophy here, or do you think we miss all the, you want to see stars still? You know, I got mixed emotions. You know, I, I would love for the Lakers to still be in there fighting for it. Um, you know, but I, I would love to see the new blood, you know, to see the Suns play the Hawks in the finals. I think that'll be new and exciting and fresh. And, and that's the series I want to see. So, you know, at this point, uh, I do want to see the youngsters shine, uh, some new blood in the water, uh, and, you know, somebody else win the title. You think Chris Paul's been one of the most underrated players in NBA history? No, I don't think he's underrated. Uh, I think people give Chris Paul, you know, 
a lot of love. You know, he's been doing more commercials and endorsements than probably anybody in the league besides LeBron. So he's just not been on a championship team. That's all. So that's why it seems like he's not getting his props. But everybody that you speak about and speak to know that he's one of the most premier point guards, you know, in the league now or who's ever been in the league. You know, he, he knows when to pass. He knows when to shoot. He knows when to get his teammates involved, and he knows when to take over. So that's what you want. Got to ask you some Raider questions. What do you make of the Raiders in Vegas? Are you cool with it? I'm cool with it. You know, if they can't be in Oakland or L.A., Vegas is the next best thing. I heard they was talking about going to San Antonio. You know, I wasn't with that at all. (laughs) Raiders belong in California and Nevada. West Coast, definitely. So, um I'm with it. You know, I'm enjoy it. Uh, we're playing a lot of our games in Vegas this year, starting July 10th, every Saturday in Vegas. we got a couple of Saturdays in New Orleans. But for the most part, we're right there in that town. I think it's a great town. And it's shown that it's a sports town, you know, with, with what is done, getting behind the Golden Knights, that, you know, the Raiders going to fit right in with that community. I have to ask you about the Carl Nassib story. What's your take on it? The who, the what, the huh? The Carl Nassib story. He came out and he's the first active gay player that uh, the Raiders threw their arms around him. The National Football League threw uh, their arms around him. QB's the first active player. And again, I think you and I would look at that like, who cares, man? I mean, he's, can he play? He's not and can he help player. win, right? He's not the first active player. He's probably the first one to come out. And, you know, you know, ain't nothing wrong with with, with, a, with a man being himself. So, you know, um, I'm pretty sure it has nothing to do with how he plays football. And, you know, as long as he can, you know, do what he's supposed to do on the field, who cares? Correct, man. I, so, I Someone asked me that question. I went, can he play? I don't, hey, dude, you think we sit around talking about people's politics and, and their sexuality? I just want to know if... The, if the brother can play, man, that's all I care. Hey, what what projects are you working on, Cube? I mean, I know I saw something a couple months ago. You dropped something too. Um, what projects are you working on right now? Um, I'm I'm you know working with the Mount Westmore crew. You know me, Snoop, Too Short, E40. We got a group. We're gonna drop some music soon. Uh, so we just kind of getting that kind of cocked and ready. Um. You know, I just did a movie, uh, War of the Worlds. That's going to be coming out, uh, you know, early next year. I'm about to do a movie with Jack Black. Um, you know, that's kind of cool and fun, you know, funny. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still doing it. But right now, it's all about the big three. That's what's, what it's all about this summer. we got great players, you know, from Joe Johnson to Swaggy P to Leonardo Barbosa to Josh Smith. I mean, we got it all. So this summer on on CBS, on Triller, on Fight TV, um, we're going to be every Saturday going at it. Hey, how many fans are going to be allowed to go to the games? Because I think that's probably important. Are we going to be able to see 90% max? Can they buy tickets? Do you have, where can they go? Where Where's the website that they can go to get these tickets and availabilities, what cities you're going to be in? Because I'm sure you have a schedule of what cities you guys are going to be touring in. Yeah, we're in Vegas this year and New Orleans and our, and our playoffs and championships are in the Bahamas. So you can plan that trip too. <laughs> Man, hit us on Ticketmaster. You can go to big3.com slash tickets. Um, you can you can go to the Big Three website, um, you know. So if you want to be a part of this league, it's the hottest league in the summer. We're going to allow full capacity. We're playing at the Orleans Arena uh, in Vegas, uh, which, you know, it holds about 8,000. See, we didn't know we was going to be able to have fans, so we would have been in T-Mobile. But but we're uh, happy that the Orleans Arena welcomed, but welcomed us with, with open arms. You know, they have a great uh, facility there, a great hotel, um, and, you know, it's Vegas, baby, so we're going to have fun. Man, before I got you on, I was playing the gangster, the killer, and the dope dealer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, that, uh, that's that nine-inch nail sample, man. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> hey, man, I love that music. West Side Connection, man. I know NWA, man, was awesome, man, and it laid the cement for you, man. But, dude, that West Side, it's the best album I've ever heard rap style. You know, AQ, lastly here, why do I look at today's rappers and do this? Man, I, I, I just don't feel it. And maybe it was maybe because I'm older. I like the gangster rap because, to me, it told the story of you guys and all the journeys that you guys went on when you guys were making this and making this, this, this genre here than how you guys got to where you were. There was more of a story. Today, it just seems it's so commercial. Is that, am I right when I say it? It's just don't feel it like you guys felt it back in the day. Yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, everybody's in love with their own generation. Um, I just think, you know, you're just more, you know, in tune. You was going through it right when we was going through it. So it was, everything was more vivid. You know, now it feels, you know, a lot of uh, very cartoon-like. And so, um, you know, I get with some of these artists today. Some of them I can't. But that's how it was back in the day, too. You know, everybody wasn't wasn't good. So, you know, I just think, you know, with groups like us, we followed our passion. We didn't know we was going to make a lot of money. And these groups today, I think they, they're going for the money. And so uh, it's a different guess it's a different vibe yeah when i'm doing when i'm doing security for two live crew my grandmother's like who's two live crew i said you don't Graham. you don't you you, you don't want to know that <laughs> uncle luke man you don't you, you don't need to know it it's all good <laughs> hey cube thank you man hey don't forget man big three basketball we're gonna catch up again sometime in july right cube we'll catch yeah. up again we'll do it i am so excited amy trask has told me all about you guys the schedule this year it's going to be off the chain, man. And you've done such a great job with this big three hoop. Cube, you're always great to me, brother. I appreciate our friendship, man. Thank you. Thanks, Dan, man. Anytime. Um, and look, check us out, man. We're on CBS all summer long, every Saturday. And after the CBS games, we're on Triller and Fight TV. Check us out. Got it, man. Thank you, Cube. Yeah, yeah. Thank That's you, my man. man. Right there, Ice Cube, man. No question about it. We'll take a quick time out right back here on the National Football Show. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say. But as I always say. It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods. Your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org. On the field of life, First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. 
This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. I'm in trouble now. Dan Cilio, National Football Show. So, Ice Cube just tweeted out on my Twitter page, at Dan Cilio Show. Just about ready to go on Dan's show in five minutes. And I just thanked him for coming on. So I just got a text message from Snoop Dogg. Okay, so when am I coming on? <laughs> and I'm like, dog, man, come on, don't do this, man. He goes, I'm going to tweet out too, man. You went with Ice Cube over me. I said, well, I like his music more than you. <laughs> He's like, what? I said, dog, I, you know, hey, man, I... I I like Cube's music, man. I, I always have liked Cube's music. And, and Snoop's like, so you don't like the chronic? I said, that's Dre's music, bro. <laughs> I said, hey, man, I think you sang on that thing, but I don't know about it, that being you, man. Dog pound, all right. But I don't know, man. Chronic, I think that's Dre's. So we have a – you know what's really cool about my friendships with all these guys? It really does go back to my days at the University of Miami with Luther Campbell. We got to get Uncle Luke on. He ripped me a new one because I blew him off one day on getting him on the show. And he's like, man, you scheduled me. And you just blew me off? I'm like, no, nah, man, I didn't blow you off. My guys know who I was mad at at the time. I was mad as hell, man. I just said, I'm not putting him on either. And so I, I just said, all right, man. So we'll get Luther on. But it's true, man. So back in the day when I was a young kid at the University of Miami, I used to go on these um, these tours with two live crew, and we worked security. And the only reason that Luther Campbell took big sills was he goes, Cilio, let me hook you up here on something. You ain't a white boy. I was like, what do you mean I ain't a white boy? He goes, I mean, you Italian, man. White guys don't run that fast. <laughs> white, white defensive tackles don't run 4'8 to 285. I said, Okay, well, I'll, I I think I'm going to take that as a compliment. And so Uncle Luke used to use me, Jerome Brown, and a bunch of other people as security. And my grandma finally, you know, because back in the day, I think it was Bush 43 or 41. It was 41. And Bush 41 was going, you know, they were going after and trying to censor all the rappers because the rappers were talking so much, you know what, on their songs, you know, Cop Killer and all that stuff. And, you know, you, if you go and listen to country music, country music talks about drinking and shooting people and what have you. It just was delivered differently. And that's what the rappers were trying to say. Well, what's the difference between what I'm singing about and what Waylon Jennings is singing about? And so Luther Campbell used to tell me all that. Well, get this. So when I was working, guess who would show up? Tupac Shakur would show up or like the Sugar Hill Gang would show up. Here's this kid sitting backstage watching these rappers who I had. Back then, these guys were just making their bones, man. Nobody knew who they were, right? And Cool Mo D walks in. Or any of those great legendary guys that really started the, the music industry on the rap side were all walking in, and Luther was pressing his own vinyl at the time. And so I'm just sitting back there, and I'm watching all this. And I'm sucking it all up, and I'm still friends to this day with Luther Campbell. You see Uncle Luke talking to me all the time. What a great dude he was. And if you remember right, he was one of the greatest poster, sh poster childs for the U University of Miami. His covers on his albums, he was dressed in Miami gear. He had the Miami jacket on. He was always pimping to you. Uh, he, Mr. 305, and he introduced all of us to all these guys. So here comes NWA and a hey, easy -E, madam. All these guys come rolling in and they loved the Miami hurricanes back then because we were gangsters, man. 
we were original. We were really the original OGs of college football. Dudes I played with, man. These guys were the real deal, dude. And hey, hey, man, they could be selling drugs at night and playing football on a Saturday afternoon. It really didn't matter, man. Those guys were really hardcore dudes. You know, I tell everybody, you didn't win championships at the University of Miami with choir boys. That football program was littered with dudes, man, that had no avenue. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why the university is not the same. I mean, even, even now, Ice Cube has a Miami Hurricane in one of his songs. So it was really cool catching up with him. We'll do it again. He wants to come back on July 9th to talk a little bit more about Big 3 basketball, and we've been a big fan of it. So we're going to get Ice Cube back on. And by then, we'll be already in training camp. Hey, hey, I bring up the Carl Nassib story. He's like, Sills, just make sure the dude can play. <laughs> I'm like, okay, man, I'll leave it there. Just make sure the guy can play. All right. Real quick here. I do want to throw this out. You know, we talked about Kyle Shanahan earlier, and we talked about Mike Tomlin. I'm going to throw another legendary name at you here. Bill Belichick. What do you make of Bill Bel? It's a stupid question when you put it that way. What do you make of Bill Belichick? Well, he's won six Super Bowls. That's not counting the two he won as coordinator of the New York Giants. So there's eight. Not counting the fact that he did lose three. So we're talking roughly, what is that? Eight. 11 conference championship rings he has. If you want to throw the other one in too, when he was a special assistant on that Patriots team after he got fired from Cleveland, you know, he wasn't the D coordinator of that Patriots team that ended up getting beat by the Green Bay Packers. So he's got 12 conference championship rings. He's got six Super Bowls, man. So when you go like this, what do you make of Belichick? Come on, Sills. But here, let me throw this at you here. Okay, so Tom Brady clearly has shown that he doesn't need Bill Belichick to win a Super Bowl. Does Bill Belichick need Tom Brady to win a Super Bowl? Or, more to the point, does Tom Brady, and has Tom Brady proven this league is more about the quarterback than it is about the coach. Don't you think if Bill Belichick has two consecutive losing seasons, you start to say this about Belichick? Hey, man, we know we said this about George Seifert. When George Seifert was coaching the San Francisco 49ers, and he had that insane great record, and he was winning all those games as the head coach of the 49ers, did we not go like this? This guy's going to punch his ticket to Canton. He ended up beating Chargers in the Super Bowl. This guy had a great resume. All of a sudden, what happens? He ends up going to Carolina, and everyone went, okay, well, guess what? That dude's not exactly who he says he is. And we all started going like this. Well, George Seifert's not a very good. Aren't we kind of doing that a little bit about Mike McCarthy? You know, we're doing this. We watched him not be able to handle a football team last year after Dak Prescott got hurt in Dallas. I mean, I went like this about Mike McCarthy. Is that dude really the right dude? for the Dallas Cowboys moving forward. And here's a guy that many people thought and have great respect for. You sit there and you're going like this with the guy. The guy's a fantastic coach. And I'm like, really? So if Bill Belichick does this, if Bill Belichick has two consecutive losing seasons, let's go back to Cleveland for us. And by the way, I'm not suggesting in any way, but you know people are going to, and the Belichick haters are going to do this. What if Bill doesn't put a football team together and that football team wins and can win without Tom Brady? See, I think what Bill is preparing to do here to try to build back the football team and try to build back the organization into being a contender in the AFC East, maybe even a little bit harder than what Brady did by going to a ready-bake football team that had all the cookies on the table that you wanted to eat. Don't you think it's easier to parachute into a situation if you're the quarterback and go, hey, I'll tell you what, 
I think I can lead that football team to the promised land because they have all the pieces. When you're a head football coach in the NFL, man, you got to do this. Hey, I may have the quarterback, but my defense sucks. My running game's not that hot. What about my old line? I think building an NFL team, I think Bill's got a tough task ahead of him. Now, look, COVID really was an issue. I think Cam's going to have a way better year, a way better year than he did uh, last year because of COVID. Let's not forget he ended up catching COVID too. So make no mistake about it. I think the Patriots are going to be a really good football team this year. I think they got their future quarterback too in Mac Jones. And I think they're going to be one of those sneaky teams that at the end of the day could potentially end up sneaking themselves into a playoff. Remember, we're talking about 17 games this year. You got more latitude to make up some uh, mistakes that maybe you go through a uh, two-game losing streak or something now with an extra game. All right. Appreciate everybody. Hey, by the way, do me a favor. If you missed any of the show, we had Jeff Lagerman on and Ice Cube on today. Please go over to the Jacob Media channel. Like it. Share it. We really appreciate that. You come aboard here each and every single day. Thank you so much for doing that. Krause, Cal, Big Joe, you guys keep doing it. We'll catch you tomorrow, 4 to 6 Eastern time. We'll catch you.